I like to go out to the desert because I love the desert sky. I love the stars. There's so many stars you can't even count. And I love, I love watching the Milky Way as it marches across all night long. It, it, it is a miracle, really, and we're really out of control of that. One of the reasons I like to go out to the desert is because I want to get away from it all. I don't want any responsibility. And God has given me that opportunity when I go to the desert. I'd like to tell you about miracles on the street and full gospel businessmen. Everyday life is full of miracles and full gospel businessmen and miracles on the street are ordinary men and women who have experienced miracles. The best miracle we can experience is knowing God. Knowing the God of this vast sky that's in the desert that we have no control over. Miracles happen when we give control to God. When we give control of our lives to God. When we simply pray, Lord Jesus, I give you control of my life. What we do is we provide real live people, people who have actually experienced the love of God through their testimonies, through their stories, and their lives have been made better. And we are here to encourage you to give your life to Jesus. Thanks to Terry and Miracles on the Street. Miraclesonthestreet.com you can see a couple of our meetings and a couple of other testimonies that Terry has, has put on. It's all about you and what's your miracle. It has nothing to do with me. It's your miracles. And I believe, as I told Ken and shared, that Revelation says, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. See, a testimony will send people, draw people to God where they might not go to church. But uh, they'll listen to a testimony of what God's doing in your life. And it just may be somebody in the same situation that you're in that will change their situation, change their outcome. So that's what it's about. You and your miracle. Books. You got a book? You'll hear part of the story tonight from Dr. Rose. We're looking forward to this. But I'm sure she's not going to read this. So, but you can. And you can take this home and you can help support Dr. Rose's ministry. Rose Park. Father, we just bless you. We thank you, Father, for this time of fellowship, this time of Colonia, Father. Father, just so wonderful, just being amongst you, people, Father. And I just bless you, and I thank you for such an awesome occasion. Everything has been done just beautiful. We just, we just bless you. And you be going on in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, I, just, I just flow, so I got to give it as whatever I, how I, I you know, go, okay, man? So, um, I honor God for this time. I thank God for my sister. Um, she has to leave, but I'm the baby of my family. 
and they have just like spoiled me. I don't know what they did to me when I was a little kid, but I thought my birthday was a holiday, you know, yeah. <laughs> all my life. Yeah. I still think it's a holiday. <laughs> so, but, so I'm really like a really like a kid when it comes to my birthday life, you know. So, I and, and I when I opened my phone, I saw a missed call. I said, she's not coming. You know, it's like my mom is here, my dad, you know, so I'm glad that you came. I guess they know. She, you know I was going to be upset. <laughs> so I, thank, I thank you for coming. It really means a lot, you know, and, and I thank all of you for coming. I mean, I'm overwhelmed at, you know, when, when, you, when, 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 when we accept Christ in our life, when we accept Christ for the first time, we're like big kids and we, you know, the world, I mean, for me, I thought the world changed. I didn't know it was me. It's like I saw the trees, I saw the birds, I saw, did anybody else experience that? Like, you know, you saw stuff that you didn't never see before. You could hear the music, you could hear the words, you could see your feet, you know, you could just, life was real, you know, and so, and then all the, all the, the things that God showed you. And then sometimes as time goes on and the religious stuff come on and, you know, you get to be a, you know, really, I stayed like a new Christian until I came home from prison, which I'll tell you about that in a minute. But then you go around a lot of churches and then there's the professional Christian. So you don't have to be professional as a Christian. So being a professional Christian is not really that fun, you know, it's kind of, you know. But I thank God for bringing everything back home, the testimonies that you guys shared, what you're doing. You know, it, you know, for the Lord. That's what we need to be doing. I loved going to convalescent hospital. Love seeing. Actually, I live in a senior complex. <laughs> you know, so you're not a senior uh, yet, but you know, there's people that need help. And so, I, my husband is a senior, so he, you know, I said I want to live there. You know, you know. So, um, and I'm like way younger. You know. Those are jokes. <laughs> but, but I thank God, and then even all the, the songs that were sung, I really enjoyed doing the and the songs that Shana, I don't know where Shana went, but the, they were they were chosen really carefully, and even the last song, He wants us to give Him our all, because every now and then, as we grow each day in our life, sometimes the cares of the world and different things that happen in our life, we forget that God can answer each and everything, no matter what it is. He hasn't changed. So I needed to say all that, you know, because it's good. I thank God for uh, Sister Michelle, who um, is, uh, she was ready to pray for your wife deliverance. She's like, you know, we gotta pray, you know. You know. So she was ready to get that devil by the throat and wring his neck for your wife. She was getting ready to knock him down, you know. And I thank God for her because when I was going through a couple of years ago, um, and I don't know if any of you have experienced this stuff, but when you can't really pray and you just, you know, you don't even want nobody praying for you either, you know. So, is it just me? I want to see some hands. Have anybody ever felt like that? Okay. And when you're in ministry, you ain't supposed to feel like that. But to tell the truth, that's how you feel. Amen. She came over to, to my, my, my house and prayed for me and laid out on my floor, crying out to God for, on my behalf. Amen. And just because she did to see that act of love for me, she brought me prayer books and made me like pray this prayer in the morning and pray this one at night. Pray, you know, and I was almost scared not to. You know, I think I was almost praying for her. You know, you know. So then, when I didn't cooperate, she stopped talking to me. You know, which I understand because if you labor for somebody and they ain't trying to fight their way through, you say you don't forget it. You want to pray? If you don't want to pray, I ain't gonna waste all my time praying for you. You don't want to pray for yourself. You know. So anyway, she stopped talking to me for about a year. <laughs> I just got her to talk to me. <laughs> well, I like that. Our time when we have to go into separation. Oh, just, come on, let me share my testimony. <laughs> but we all know that. We know that that we have to do what God tells us to do. I, I know it's not personal. It was okay because I knew that God that God was dealing with me. And and then in the war, because the Bible says, "To whom much is given, much is required." So as we go into higher heights and deeper depths. You know, the call is much greater. So the obstacles that come up against us are more stronger. You know, so, you know, and I got a couple of more obstacles that's coming up against me. 
You know, and God is always talking to us if we're listening. Amen. You know, if we're listening, he's constantly talking. Right. So I got some situations in my life, and when the girl's dancing, he said he wants you to give you all, your all, your all, your all. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. You know, because there's some areas that I got to surrender. Because we struggle when we don't surrender. Here God said, don't eat that. I'm going to eat it anyway. Or is that just me? You know, I know it ain't just me, you know. Because everything we all going through, we all go through it. We all go through some of the same exact things. I've been dealing with pastor in a church, overseeing a Bible college. And the, as much as I love God, and as much as I'm going through, I know that it ain't just me. You understand know what I'm saying? So, it ain't just me. And sometimes we go through stuff that ain't even about you. It's about somebody else to know what they're going through. So now you say, oh, okay. And when you get your deliverance or your victory and you find how to get past it, you know how to tell somebody else how to get past it. So now that I said all that, sir, good evening. <laughs> My name is Dr. Rose. And the Lord blessed me to be Dr. Rose because, you know, Rose Parker is the name that made history. You know, people call me Rose Parker, but that's my second, that, that's, my, that's my first husband. You know, he, you know, I ain't married to him, and plus he died, you know. <laughs> but but that's the name, because he was like, why you keep calling yourself Rose Parker? You divorced me. And I said, I didn't want to take my name to prison. <laughs> Those are jokes. You know, you're going to have to do like this. Let me get a laugh card. Laugh. <laughs> laugh. Laugh. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> But I was married to my first husband. I, I was raised in the church. My father is a pastor. You know, I'm the youngest of, of, of seven that lived. My mom had nine kids. Mom married my dad when she was 15. He was 19. They were married for 12 years. My mom couldn't have kids. 12 years she was married to my dad and believed God. My father was like a Moses, took, got away from all of his family. He got like a million brothers and sisters. He took us, you know, and took his wife and my mom to California and built a life, and built a ministry. And my mom believed God for kids, and they told her she couldn't, you know, she had accidents, so they took part of her stuff. She couldn't have kids biologically. And so she believed God for her kids. And then when she told them she was having a baby, they locked her up in the mental institution in uh, Los Angeles. It was like a general hospital or something. It made the news. And then she had my brother David, you know. So my brothers are David, Paul, Peter, and Joseph. And then my older sister, Diane Carroll, and myself, that all that lives. And I'm the youngest. Stair steps. By the time they had me, she was like 38, and my dad was 40-something. So I'm, I'm born after like 25 years of their marriage. But anyway, with that heritage, my grandfather, men in ministry, and you know, all my you know, loving God and stuff like that, faith, my, my parents instilled the things of God, but because you have that kind of call on your life, you know, you know, I wanted to be bad, you know, after after being good so long. First I got married, you know, I didn't want to have like a different man in my life. Got married at sixteen, so I could only have one man. Kids have one daddy, you know, like a regular like my mom. And my mom only knew my dad. So she couldn't even tell me about stuff because she only knew my dad, you know. So anyway, but you know, my first husband was abusive. Or he was just mean, hollered and stuff. Anyway, I ended up divorcing him and got involved with, um, I, did, I did what I wanted to do. Because I didn't have a chance to do what, sleep with who I wanted to sleep with, I'll pick you. You know, whatever. I'm just being real, because I can be real honest, I'm in here right, because if I can't, then we got the wrong lady, because that's how I woke, you know. So I just did whatever I wanted to do. Right, wrong, or indifferent. You know, that's what I did, you know. If I chose to do it, because everybody else made all the decisions for me. And I want to make them, I didn't care what they were. If they weren't right, I'll take the consequences. And so I got involved with a man that um, was involved in drugs and uh, a lot of things. I was in, by then I had became in the entertainment industry, soul train dancing, a lot of different shows and stuff. So now I'm meeting a different, so in this, in the world, no matter if you're, if you're in the entertainment world or whatever life you're, style you're in, there's the entertainment, the regular group of people that don't use drugs, and then the bad group of people that use drugs. And you notice, if you're in this bad group, you're going to draw out that, you're going to serve, you're going to know the people that use drugs. Because I wasn't in the bad group at first, and I was doing television. And so, 
you know, I didn't know the people. But then when I started doing drugs, I found out the different cameramen, the light, you know, found out the different people that you can hang with on the side. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, so I'm living, you know, I'm, I'm being just destructive. A lot of things happen. Some things are in my book. A lot of bad choices that I made in my life, which caused me to be destructive. Got involved with this man, and he was older, very wealthy, and you know. Bottom line, he tried to kill me. I, I tried to get away from him after a while because I realized I don't want this life. I want to be saved. I want God. But now I'm so far away, I don't even know how to get back. I used to get high and sit in the mirror and try to, I know faith, because I knew faith. But I couldn't get from here to here. And I'm like, how do I get from point A to point B? I know God can help me. But how do I let him help me? I couldn't figure that out for the life of me. Never did figure it out. Actually, was pretty. I'm going to go to that story, but I couldn't figure it out. I just keep getting high, you know. And then I'd watch myself. I watch myself get high, and then I'll go clean. I just watch myself just trip out, you know. I would, I would just watch myself. I hate it. I hate it being away from God. I don't like being away from God, you know. Even even now, whenever I'm away from God. You know, when he's calling me and I'm not listening, you know, I hate being away from him. But then, I, you know, I said, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. I don't know that I'm setting myself up and my mom is praying. Even when I was in prison, my mom said she didn't care. If I ever took me to go to prison for God to take my, you know, to get me back on track, you know, you, you have peace knowing that your child loves God and is trusting God no matter what situation that they find themselves in. I'm my dad's baby girl. And for me to be locked up in prison and pregnant was not, not a good feeling for a parent, you know. But anyway, but I um, end up on that particular night, um, the guy came to my house and tried to kill me, held me hostage four days, and my brother came to rescue me. And when he came to rescue me, I grabbed the gun and I shot the, bu the bullet hit my brother, wounded him. And it, one bullet hit two people. And so it wounded my brother and got him and it killed him. And so they ended up taking me to, to jail, fought my case, and then went to prison. You know, first they, nobody believed I did it. I kept telling the police I did it. And they're like, they it had to be my brother. It couldn't have been me. You know, so that's, those are like a lot of different stories up, up inside my story. But they gave me a life sentence. And the thing about it, I knew that I'm pregnant. I have a 19-month-old son. This man is in my house. He got two guns, one in the car. How are you gonna put me in prison? And you know, so I knew that the truth was gonna come out. So I just figured I'll just wait it out till the truth came out. But I didn't know it was gonna take like 15 years. <laughs> so 15 years. So, um, but I always held fast that God was going to deliver me, that the truth was going to come out. They called me crazy. I was packing my stuff like every week. I don't know if anybody ever been in prison, but I would pack my stuff and go to the mail room with my little cart. They said, where are you going to go to the parking lot? I'm my stuff because I'm going home. And it, it, when I look at it now, you know, God sets us up, you know, for different things that we have to do by faith to just do what he say do. You know, like when Noah was building the ark. All we know is going to rain. Yeah. Ain't never rained before. Yeah. They don't even know what the word rain means. Me, but he's, God said it's going to rain. He said it's going to rain. So he built an ark. It's going to rain. He built an ark. I said, I'm just going home. You know. But our governor said ain't nobody never going home except for the pine box. The law had changed. The governor made a statement. Nope, nobody's going home. Nobody went home. When I went home, I'm jumping the gun, but this is my story. So I can do that. And I had a floor. <laughs> when I went home, the parole board, the parole computer didn't even register to have a lifer come home. They they had only registered for th you know three years because when you get out of prison, parole is three years. But when you're lifer, it was five, but no but lifers had went home. So the computer was programmed to stop in three years. So they gave me three years parole. And then when I fought to have one, then they said, No, you have five years parole. You know, and then you know, so that's an, so I, I'm just saying that. So now I'm going back to where I was at. <laughs> so now I'm in prison fighting for my life, telling people all the time I'm going home. And so just to show you how the Word of God worked, I had gave my life that, that um, right before that incident happened, I'm trying to get saved. I'm trying to find God. I'm trying to get to God. But I just can't figure it out. 
you know, but I, my brother said, let's go to church. And I said, and, and he wanted to go early. You know, some people like to go early. You know, said, uh, it was his church. I guess he was supposed to be early. <laughs> he was the pastor. You know, and I'm the sister. You know, I don't want to be there an hour early. Why would anybody want to be there an hour early? You know, it don't make no sense. But when you're in ministry and you be there, you got to be there to set up, make sure there's no toilet overflow, to make sure it's clean, you know, make sure, you know, everybody there and praying and work, you know, whatever. So I wasn't going early. So I'm saying, I, I want to come like right when it's time to go. <laughs> you know, what is it? Laugh card. <laughs> but anyway, so I didn't want to go early. And when I made that choice not to go early, that was the day the man came. And that was the first day of the four day ordeal. And um, so when I went to prison, I had gave my life to God. Because that night when he was getting ready to kill me, I know, I'm like asking God to help me. And I'm petrified, tetrified, you know, beyond, you know, you know, everything. And so, so. So now I gave my life to God, and I'm not playing. I'm not playing. I'm in the county jail, believing God for miracles. I mean, you know, when people ask me for my testimony, there's so many things God did. When I'm in the county, I ain't even sitting to life yet, because you couldn't tell me I was going to prison, you know. So I'm pregnant, and so I'm figuring all the police is my security, you know. I got security watching over me, you know. So I'm pregnant. I wasn't taking good care of myself. But in the jail, they gave me three meals. They made me eat milk. They gave me some vitamins, prenatal. So I'm fine. So, but now it's time for me to have my baby. So I tell them that I was ready to go. They said, you can't go. You in court. You gotta. You ain't supposed to have no bill. I said, oh, no, I watch people come to, I watch people come to court, come to, to jail, and they say O-R. And they let them out. I didn't know what it meant, but I know the word. Say O-R. That's <laughs> 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 word. O-R, get out. You know? And then, and then they go out, don't go to court, get arrested, come back on a FTA, failure to appear, uh -huh. and they give them another OR. <laughs> but sure, I can go home because I'm going to come to court. Yeah. Yeah. You ain't going to have to arrest me two times. So I'm just going to go and I'll come to court. So the, my lawyer said, you ain't supposed to have a bill. I can't even ask for you to have an OR. I'm like, Sure, my dad's a judge. Let's, let, let's do this. Because you know? I had to breastfeed. My mama killed me if I don't breastfeed. You know, signing me to have my baby. I got to go home. You know, to, you know, I'm arrested for 187. Y'all know 187 is first degree murder. Everybody's tripped out. The judge, the DA, the, the, the DA is indignant that I had the gall to ask for an OR. You know, so the first day they asked for the OR, he was like, she ain't supposed to have a pill. Ah! And then the judge, I don't know if anybody's old as me, but there was a Judge Allen in San Bernardino, and he was like the mean judge. He reduced my bill to $10,000. It was 150 you know. Then they ruled manslaughter, and then they, they dropped it like 10000 And people was like, man, but I was supposed to go home free. So when I came to court, people were making fun of me. Rose Parker thought you were going home. I said, how much is your bill? And they said their bill was whatever it was, so my bill was $10,000, you know. But God said I couldn't get bailed out. So the next week, I went back to, to court and I asked, it was another judge, and I asked, could I go home? He said, decline. That was a different word, but you know, still was no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of days later, I went back to court, and now I'm not talking. Because I was talking to everybody, to the DA. They was like, don't talk to him. I'm like, come here, I want to tell you something what happened. You know, I want to tell him what happened, so they let me go. You know? But anyway, so I wasn't talking, I got to sit at the, Cause normally you're in the like the, the jury box, but now I get to sit at the table and I'm pregnant, so I'm just going like this, <laughs> talking to nobody, just sitting in there like this. And next thing, the DA and my attorney was talking, and they said, "Let her go. She ain't a risk." They gave me an OR. I got an OR, yeah. first humor, and breastfed my baby, brought my baby up to the visiting room, mm -hmm. and walked around that everybody see. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I fought my case from the street. They they convicted me of first degree murder, put me back in jail. Nobody wants to, you know, like, you know, they don't know what to say now, you know. Maybe God ain't with her, God, you know. So, but God was talking to me because when I got home, you know, I was like, my father was the preacher, and I'm his daughter, but I'm the super Christian now. I saw the big miracles, you know. So you know how when you first, some people get saved, they want to tell you how to serve God. I want to fix their marriage, my mother and dad. I want, you know, I said, you don't, you're not, you're the devil, you know. So like, they didn't let me do what I wanted to do. You're the devil, you know. So but I said, God, why don't go back to jail? He, in the scripture, you know, he talked to me through the word. 
Why I, I saw men walking the trees, I needed that second touch, right? So when he revealed that to me, like wide right away, okay, I got the second touch, can I go, right? You know, but it took like 14 more years before I actually got out of prison. But anyway, but through the, the time incarcerated, you know, when you look at um, the intimacy with God, there were times where I knew how to touch the heart of God. I mean, you could, I could touch the heart of God, and I knew I was getting ready to go home, and then there was this one girl that truly, she used to come in the prison, and she had lost her mind. And she, every time she'd be a cat, James, you know some of their language? <laughs> <laughs> she would um, she, she had lost her mind. So she would come in and then put her with the sight and she'd be on the and she was a young girl walking around, you know, and so my heart it pricked my heart one day when I when I saw my miracle getting ready to happen and I said, God, do it for her. Just do it for her. You know, whatever whatever you're gonna do for me, do it for her. Amen. And I never saw her again. But she was coming back and forth in the prison, year after year. I was there 15 years, so I know who goes back and forth. Some people only stay out 90 days, you know, two months, you know, they're back, you know. So she was back and forth for like, maybe like seven years. So well, she never came back, because I wanted God to restore her mind and heal her, you know, so she don't, because she was too young to be crazy like that, you know. So there were, there were a couple times where I knew I gave my miracle away. But then there was time I said, this one is on me. This, is, I, this ain't going nowhere, this is mine, you know. So, I, so I'm still packing my stuff up and doing everything I knew to do. You know, people want ministry. People want to do things for God. And I would always tell them at the, at the chapel in the prison, you know, because chapel in the prison is like church here. They want the mic. Everybody, when they first get say they want the mic. I say, you know, you don't know what's up here. You know, so do, you know, you want ministry? Watch the movement sheet, which is the, our newspaper, to tell you who come to prison, who go, who getting ready to go. When you see their name, go see if they know the Lord. Find that one person, minister that one person. That's your assignment. Get that one down. These little things, you know, these are little things you could do if you want to do something for God. You know, there's so many things people can do for God. Just stand in front of thrifties, you know. You don't have thrifties no more, huh? <laughs> you gotta go. Thank you for saying. Okay, I love you. I love you too. Anyway, so um so there's so many things. So anyway, so when it was time to go, there was nothing. You can leave it. I get it. There was nothing left for me to do in the prison. I had done everything that was in that prison to do. So I said, my assignment is up. I did everything. I did stuff that the volunteer chaplains couldn't do. I created a program when they stopped letting the volunteer chaplain go over here because this thing happened. I I I filled out a proposal to let me go in the that unit to minister, to do Bible study. So every little thing I did, the aerobics in the psych unit, I ministered at RC, the reception center, the support care unit. I did all those things. I was a women's advisory council chairperson. You know, all, everything. I did everything there was to do. So now it's time to go. But the governor said, now Greg Davis said, he ain't never let nobody out. And I'm putting signs up there. Before he got elected, I put a sign up there because everybody's rooting for him. He's going to let everybody out. And everybody's happy, and I put a sign up. God gave me work. Don't put your hope in man, put your hope in God. Put the sign up there. They tore it down. Then Great Davis got elected and said he wouldn't let nobody out. Everybody's sad. I put the same sign up. Don't put your trust in man, put trust in God. They still sort of sign down. But anyway, but I knew that God was going to let me go home, especially because now it's getting warm. Then he put another report out. If you go home, you're going home in a pine box, period. That's it. These are quotes. October 3rd and, uh, and April 29th, those were his two statements. At the same time, I'm doing appeals for parole hearings. I'm doing a lot of different things. Those are other testimonies there in my book. But the bottom line is, um, I gotta, I'm got going to give you this scripture. When I first knew that God was going to take me home, I'm not going to read it. I mean, find it. I'll just tell it, I'll tell it to you. When I first um, got the word biblically about me going home, it's Jeremiah 29, 11. Because I was praying and believing God. I got the little baby, my baby crying for me. Because remember, I was praying and I had the baby. Now he too got a two year old shot. All he wants is me. How he want me? He don't even really know me that well. But all he wants is his mom. So I said, I got to go. You know, so then I got this, the word, scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. To give you a future and a hope or an expected end. What's my expected end? I'm going home. You'll go and seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I'll be found by you. And I will turn away your captivity and deliver you from the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. 
There you have it. That's the word right there. Right? Is that what it said? Is that what it said? You gonna pray? You you want you expect him to go home? I'm gonna give you an expected end. You gonna seek me and you gonna find me, and I'm gonna turn away your captivity. And then you from the place I called you to be carried away captive. Because I know God allowed me to come there. Because why would they put a pregnant lady? A man came in our house to kill her. He allowed me to go there. So here it is. So I'm waiting to go. That was 1988. So I keep telling everybody this is 1988. 8, 9, 9, 9, 1, 9, 2, 9, 3, 9, 4, 9, 5. I said, I said, I'm still there. So now I go to the board in the year 2000. They still ain't giving nobody dates. All the officials that, because they like me, because I'm doing all kind of stuff, making, you know, the having them disturb inmates and writing the uh, IST in service training for the police. I'm doing all kind of stuff up in there. My parents say they keeping you in there because you keep the prison calm. So I'm doing all kind of proposals, running, working for the captain, working for the warden. Right now, like the warden, she on my book, she did the did the uh, forward in my book, you know. Right when I when I got a date, she left. She resigned. <laughs> She went home, she paroled November, I went home in December. But anyway, so, let me see if I can stay where I'm at. So anyway, so, um, December, how many minutes I got? 10, 5, 2, oh. <coughs> Okay, okay, well y'all are too slow, go like this. Okay. okay, so anyway, so, so now, I go to the board, but everybody's worried because they say, she thinks she going home. So they like me a little bit, so they kind of like, Everybody like, is she going to be broken when she don't go? Is she okay? They like all tripped out because she going to go to the board and they're not going to let her out. And they all be like, you, know, you watch people that they be worried about you. You like looking, I ain't. I said, I don't know. They say, you post up. Hope for the best and expect the worst. Or something like that. Hope. They expect the worst and hope for the best. Or one of them two, whatever it is, why would you do hey, Why would you expect the worst? Hope for the best, expect the best. Who made that rule up? I said, that's a crazy rule. Y'all heard that rule before? <laughs> Hope for the best, expect the worst, or something like that. That don't even make sense. Y'all didn't go for it, though, did you? <laughs> no, you hope for the best, expect the best, and expect it in. You expect the best. You know, what's a, a disappointment is a disappointment. Whether you expected it or didn't expect it, it's still a disappointment. So what difference does it make if you get it, wanting it or not? Don't matter. You know, you're going to be disappointed if you don't go. But if you thought you was going to go, you don't get to go. You still disappointed? What difference do it make? So I'd rather be disappointed than was expecting to go home. At least I was halfway home. You know? <laughs> At least I was almost home. You know? so, so I was going home and went there. And I took a, see now I got letters from, I already told the psych, right? The psychologist, you got to go see the psych. And I keep telling them, they're going to tell the truth. Everybody's going to tell the truth, right? The DA, I'm, the judge. The police, they're going to tell the truth, right? So I'm telling the site this all these years, right? So he's writing them the reports. She's naive, she's childlike, you know, and sightless. He's writing all this stuff in my board reports, you know? So, they're, so when they see me at the board, they're saying, but guess what? He got the letter from the police. Amen. He got the letter from the judge. Amen. He got the letter from the DA and the probation department. And my own attorney that said it was his fault. Everybody wrote letters in my case. The copies are in my book. And I, I, they're on the internet. They're on certain, certain places. Because I, I made copies of them. Said she should have never been in prison. So, so I'm at this psych hearing. And the psych, he's like, are you okay? I said, the question is, I'm okay. I already knew the letters were coming. I've been telling you all these years. They ain't going to tell the truth. The question is, are you okay? You the one with the PhD that supposed to have a skill in psychology to determine whether the person is psychotic or have an issue. But you allowed paperwork to determine, and you didn't use your God-given ability to discern whether a person was actually telling the truth. So then if I'm okay, I already said what's going to happen. So now how we go, what we, what we gonna do? What's, what's our game plan? So he gave me the game plan. He said, when you go to the board, you gotta have your ammunition. Whatever they gonna come up against you with, you already be prepared. Do like this. He said, when I when they when the inmates be fighting me, he gave me all these tricks. He said, when they fight me, they fight me like this, like this, like this. So he said, you gotta have it like this, like this, like that. I said, okay. 
So I went to the parole board hearing. Everything that they used to try to come up against me, I had copies. I didn't tell them fake attorneys. Cause I didn't tell none of them. I, I did my, I let them do all that little stuff. And then I came out with my own uh, submissions. Amen. And I handed them out. I said, turn to page three. You know, with it highlighted in yellow, and that one's highlighted in orange. That statement right there that y'all trying to say against me. I said, and y'all don't think I'm rude? Because I'm telling the board. Y'all don't think I'm rude? It's my life. So we fighting. I'm fighting for me. So every time you guys said I shot him twice, I said I shot him two times in the head. I said, I'm on crack. I'm high. I just know I shot the gun. I said two times, whatever I said. It ain't real. It's like whatever I said, you know. So whatever the points I was making, they were valid. I said, I said, I went like this. I didn't shoot him in the head. That's why there was no bullet hole on him. It was a fragment for me turning around shooting the floor. Everything can be proven because guess what? They got stuff that's called forensic. You know, see, they didn't have all that stuff back in 86. Us, they got forensic. They could tell what angle. They could tell every little detail that I'm saying. Everything could be proven. So they talked to me about 10 minutes. Then they said, can you excuse us? They want to deliberate. <laughs> so then they, then they told me I can go. They gave me a parole date. And so the thing about it, the people were laughing on the yard. They said the board gave you a parole date because they didn't want to see you no more. <laughs> they said, don't let her come in here. So, so now Greg Davis ain't signing parole. So it don't matter if you got a date by the board because he's not going to sign it anyway. That's the thing. The governor got to approve it. So, so they're making excuses. They're saying, governor, please, please let her out. You got to go see her then. You talk to her. You know, so, so, anyway. So this is what happened. The governor's not signing no paroles. He's not letting anyone out of jail. Period. Y'all know that. Y'all know the law. That's why, that's why I made history. Because he did something he said he would never do. So what happened is that when, when he said he would never do it, uh, people said, you're not going home. So I said, then God told me that in, in, in uh, Revelation 3, 7, and 8, he said, for he that hath the key of David and opened it and no man Shut it. I know your works. See, I set before you an open door that no man can close. I see you have little strength, have kept my word, and not denied my name. Do you know the scripture? Amen. In Revelation. Yeah. I'm like, God can talk to you in Revelations? Because when he said go to Revelations, I was like, I'm going to Revelation. But I, I know your works. I said before you an open door Amen. that no man can close. Yeah. You got a little strip, but you kept my word and I didn't have my name. I'm like, oh my God. I'm locked in, so I tell everybody. So I couldn't wait. So now people are, because people make fun of you on the yard. They, Rose Park, you're going home. So now the police, we're talking to say, oh, you're not going home, Rose Parker. You don't got it in writing. I said, I got it in writing. We're talking to It came. You got it in writing that you're going home? Yes. Go get it, let me see. I said, I walked up, I went to the room, walked over, and I said, you ready? Bam! Got him black and white and red. <laughs> black, white, and red. So anyway, so then, so uh, the governor signed my release, but then he said he wasn't going to let me out for like two and a half months. Like, it was crazy. He signed it in September, but he didn't let me out till December. But anyway, I went home, and I always thought I was going to get a pardon. They paroled me, and so um, I fought for a pardon, and... Then I stopped, but God showed me a pardon. I never ever thought I was going to be paroled. You know, why would I be paroled? I shouldn't have been in prison in the first place. And when Gray Davis released me, he made it sound like he pardoned me because every time I was fighting for my pardon, they said, "Oh, that's the lady that was pardoned." I said, "I'm not pardoned." And when I, you know, so anyway, so so I'm just up to to now. Um, a couple years ago, I have I have been home now, like going on 12 years. I've been home 11 years. So after it had been like almost 10 years, I said, God, why haven't I got my pardon? He said, well, I didn't stop. You stopped. I said, well, what do I do? And I'm like, you know how you're trying to hear God? Can you like say it like clear? Like can you like write it down? Can you like tell me like exactly verbatim, you know? And I can't get it. But something just tells me to do what I did before. So I made the petitions and I'm going to a couple of meetings of people to get to support me. And I don't know why I'm doing this, so then I talked to them. And so it was one thing I didn't ever do. Governor Schwarzenegger got an office. He was like, you need to file a new petition. I don't want to file a new petition. I never did it with Gray Davis. It just went from Pete Wilson to Gray Davis. Why I got to do it now? So I refused to do it. So God said, do a petition. Do a new petition. So I did a new petition. 
submitted it, went to the DA, tried to get him to write a letter. He said, I can't write a letter. I said, but you wrote one before, 10 years ago. He said, but I'm not in that same office. I gotta ask my authorities to write a letter. So they won't write a letter. So God said, you don't need them to write a letter. He wrote a letter. Use the same letter that he wrote at first. Amen. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, that's smart. So, and so then I called the go- I called Gray Davis office talk. Talk, been talking to the Gray Davis sector because he worked right there in Century City. So they he thinking about it. So then the lady, his secretary said, he has decided to not make any remarks. So I said, well, he's not going to help me? She said, he decided not to make any remarks. You understand? I said, okay, I understand. You understand what she said? Mm-hmm. He ain't going to fight it. Mm-hmm. But he can't say nothing because his lawyer told him don't get involved. So anyway, so I said, okay. So anyway, so I called my friend from Channel 7, Cheryl Jenny. She wrote, she said, you know, I said, what are we going to do? Because she, how are we going to do this? She said, come up here. I can't come out. I can't come out there because I don't let certain people do my stories. And so she said, come over here because I can't get there. I said, I'm going to go to the Capitol and stand in front of the Capitol and tell them to let me out. And so she said, well, come by here first, San Francisco. So I went to San Francisco, did an interview. You can see all this on the Internet. Did the interview with Channel 7. And then when it aired on TV, they had an explosion. You remember two years ago they had an explosion, a fire, and they didn't know where it came from, under the ground. Right when they showed my thing, a boom, the fire came, and they couldn't find where it came from. So that's me. You know, make my mark. <laughs> so I went to the Capitol, had a bullhorn say, I want to divine assignment to give my pardon. I want a divine assignment to give my pardon. You know, and I went and I just took pictures. I got it all. I should have blown something up and bring them sometime, you know. So I went in. So you can't do a, a, a thing at the Capitol and go in the Capitol. They have to be separate. So I separated myself and walked in with my petition. The lady in Channel 7 helped staple them together real good and made a bunch of copies. And so um, I went in the Capitol to do where they were secretary. I mean, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I said, let's take a picture. So me handing, I took all kinds of pictures because I know I'm going to be me and my husband standing in front of the Capitol doing all this posing <coughs> and stuff, you know, and gave him the stuff and, and went home. So um, then people said, well, what happened? Did you get your pardon? I said, I don't know. I just did what God said to do. And that was it. That was September the 9th, 10th. So December, on January 2nd, I get a phone call from uh, Channel 2, and they wanted to interview me about the party, you know, and I'm like, you know, what do you want to talk about? You know, because, you know, people want to interview me, you got to tell me what your question is. Send them the questions. In advance, you can't just talk to me. You got to tell me what we're going to talk about. So I said, well, I want to know what you want to talk about. She said, we're to talk about the party. I said, what you want to know about it? She said, oh, you don't even know, do you? I said, I don't know what. I said, Governor Schwarzenegger just pardoned you. We just got the press release. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So I said, no, I'm like crying. It's Sunday night. I went through already hell already with some church stuff, you know. And I'm like, I need a release somewhere. And she's like that. And so she sent me. I said, she said, you can search for I said, no, no, no. Just send it to me. And it said, Governor Day, I mean, Governor Schwarzenegger's pardons eight people. Nunez, remember that Nunez case? Everybody was mad about Nunez? Well, I didn't say that much. <laughs> I didn't do a lot of interviews. I didn't do nothing. I just did, I gave that Channel 2 theirs because they told me. And now I just did the radio. And I gave Cheryl Jennings because I always told her, I'm going to get a party and I'm going to give you an exclusive. You know? So I gave her one. And then just, just one other place, I was just somewhere at a meeting with people that helped me. Like, I'm here. I just told the news, come here. So you take a picture of everybody. And I said, I haven't, I haven't did any interviews because God said no. He said no because Governor Schwarzenegger was getting too much bad publicity. And it wasn't wise. As much as I love to be on the spotlight, you know, <laughs> that's to tell the truth. People, other people might be on the spotlight, but they don't tell the truth, you know. I tell it. I want to be celebrated, clap for me, yeah. say happy, happy, everything. You know, I love it. You know, it's just my spirit. <laughs> My spirit like to do those, you know, a little bit. I don't know if God, I don't know if we, I can't say that, you know, I didn't check later. But um, but anyway, and then after a couple months go by, three months, I said, can I, like, do a press release now? I said, I got the part so we can give God glory. He's like, hold up a minute. Next thing you know, Governor Swordman is sleeping with the maid. I'm like, my God, we well, can't really talk about this. So now God says it's time. You can start going out, you can start speaking, because I haven't been, I haven't really been doing anything. That's why some of you, did you guys know I got pardoned? Did you know that Governor Davis, did you guys know? Yeah, you know Governor Schwarzenegger pardoned somebody real good, that he did something good, huh? 
Because yeah. I'm good. And I'm going to tell him. He's going to get it. He's going to because he heard from God. Because you know anything about jail? A little bit. Okay. Well, technically, a person cannot get pardoned. You can't even ask for one until you have got a certificate of rehabilitation. You can't ask for a certificate of rehabilitation until you've been off parole 10 years. Off parole 10 years. I only been out ten years. I've been off parole for six. Six maybe six going on seven years. You know, so but the thing about it is when Governor Schwarzenegger was trying to sleep, all he could say, Rose Parker. Who's Rose Parker? Who's Rose Parker? Tell me who's Rose Parker. <laughs> so they said this one. Well girl, I'll tell her. They what well, governor, she's not supposed to be out here. They'll start to put something that's Rose Parker how to get out of the prison. <laughs> off the parole. Off the pardon. Rose Parker. <laughs> <laughs> If you read the article, it says, this was the last thing he did before he left off. The last thing he did was Mark Rose Parker. By the I think my 15 minutes is up. My last 15 minutes is up. I want to thank everybody um, for coming out, and, and I thank God for the type of setting. Um, the type of spirits that were here because it all means a lot. When people just have a heart to, to do the work of God, when, when Kim was talking about um, the lady that's over there giving love, that's so important. A usher smiling when you first walk into a church. The things that people forget to do because they're so busy. You get to church, people are so busy. Well, that's my position. I'm supposed to be the usher today. No, who is it? Where is it? Oh, she ain't over there. You know, people get so caught up in all this yeah, crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah. But forget about the lost yeah. souls that just yeah. want yeah. just want to come to God. It's like, if you see, can't go to church and tell nobody there because they going to make you sicker. <laughs> you know, like, I was sick. I couldn't tell nobody because I'm the pastor's wife. And I'm, you know, I'm Rose Parker. I'm the faith lady. Heal yourself. <laughs> Kill yourself. <laughs> and so where I'm gonna go? I couldn't even pray for myself. That's why when I said she was praying for me, I was like, I oh, ain't praying. I ain't talking. I, yeah, I just I want to take pills. Cause that's the new thing. Take a pill. I never took pill. I've been in prison. Ain't took no pill. Lost my mama. Lost my brother. Never did. The way my book looked like this because that's my spirit. Amen. Came out around all these people. Went through a little situation. The doctor gave me some man, Take this. Okay. Yeah, take this. Okay. Xanax. And some of them are like, okay, I'll take that. So now some time go by. Now some other stuff is going on. Where the pills at? You know? <laughs> some of the pills. After so many times, she said, well, I don't want you to take us for that addicted. What'd you give it to me for in the first place? <laughs> Anybody got any habits? Nobody got up. That's a whole church full of people. Nobody got up. So God said, you got one? I'm like, I got one. He said, yeah. I said, it's deliverance. I said, okay. So I got up. He said, what you want to be delivered from? He asked me, I'm Rose Park. You know, I'm like, prophetess. Prophetess Sterling. I'm the front row with all these people. Y'all know the, you know, the dresses, you know, you know, that kind of stuff, the hats and stuff. <laughs> prophetess Sterling. I'm in the front, I walk up there, I said, I'm trying to tell him in this ear. <laughs> Take pills. Instead of him keeping it between us and God, he stands up. But I didn't want those pills that he talked about. I didn't. But he got up and said, anybody here on Prozac? And so, you know, he started naming stuff. I ain't never heard of them pills. But, but do you know half the church got up and came and got them yeah. Half the church came up because so, people, yeah. the doctors, yeah. the pharmacy guy, they giving you drugs like it's a new deal yeah. to give you all these yeah. stuff for depression, anxiety. Yeah. The Bible said be anxious for nothing. But they giving you all this stuff. But anyway, I'll start all, all over yeah. again. So we gonna get it. All right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks for Here's the
the scenario, you hear the siren. An announcement takes place in heaven. There has been a robbery. Angels are dispatched. The reply comes back. We caught him. And taken back to the Lord. The Lord says, you've done a twofold robbery. You ask, wherein have I robbed you? The Lord replies, for more about this exciting book, please go to theorygiftbasket.com or Amazon.